story of the prodigal son. We look down to verse 11, Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, that is, Christ said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto him, unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found and they began to be merry. We trust that God will bless the reading of his precious word. I am sure you've heard Luke 15 preached from many times before. Everyone who has has been to meetings before, it is unlikely that you haven't heard it before. Maybe there are some in the building tonight in the meeting that haven't heard the story before, but it's, it's become, even in mainstream media and in the secular world, you sometimes hear people referring to someone being a prodigal or it's like the prodigal son perhaps somebody who went to prison for for crimes and then came out rehabilitated and did good for the community and so on they would describe him as a prodigal son so people use it in the mainstream even today and yet you know there's so little understanding of what the story is is really about They use the term and they refer it to specific things. But you know, there's an awful lot in this parable. It's one of the greatest parables and illustrations that we have in our New Testament. I would like to, before I sit down, just tell you about the what is the point of the of the parable. What is trying to be what's the message that is trying to be sent over to us? And you know, primarily. The story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, you know, it gives hope. It shows that there is an opportunity for a new beginning. No matter how low someone becomes in society, no matter where they think they're at, there is an opportunity for them. That's an important thing to note. You know, I do believe that people come and go to gospel meetings and they have very little hope within themselves of ever getting saved. They come and go to meetings, but they 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 are stuck in a rut, never seeing how they will ever be saved. There's hope for you tonight. You can be saved. Everything that is necessary for you to be saved has already been completed. You can be saved. And perhaps there are some who think that they would need to straighten out a bit and and live better for a while before they could ever think of getting saved. That's nonsense too. That's nonsense. What happened in this story is that this man just recognized what he really was. You know, that's where you need to get to tonight, is just to realize before God what you really are. Not try to be better. Not try to polish yourself up so that you might at least be acceptable to God that he would give you salvation. That's not salvation at all. There's no offer of that salvation in our Bible. None at all. So it gives hope. It gives opportunity. It shows that there is an opportunity for a complete new beginning for every soul. And secondly, it's a great parable for displaying the grace 
and, and the love of God to someone so undeserving. You know, as far as I have no children on my own, but when you read this story, you know, this was a very wayward and selfish boy. Somebody who no doubt had, had been well looked after growing up, and yet it just comes to the bit and he just wants away from it all. And he wants the money before he goes. He wants his share. And he's just going to go out and leave them all behind. There's no hope of a return or anything. This is a wayward son. And you would think perhaps that over time that the family would nearly be better off without him. He just he made his path. He stuck to it. He, that's what he chose. That's what he's getting. But there's so much love displayed from this father in this story and so much compassion and grace. And there's no mention of after the son coming back that he has to repay his debts or he has to do so much work. Once he's received back, that's it. He's received and all is forgiven. It's a great parable of forgiveness. But one thing I was going to say to you all, because there's quite a lot of younger people in the meeting tonight, I remember when I was growing up, coming to meetings, and as soon as the man read from Luke 15, I thought to myself, well, that's that's not for me. He's not talking about me. I'm only a wee boy. He's talking about the older people who are here, who are out partying and enjoying things of the world and are, are entrapped by sin. This this isn't, he's, I'm not his target tonight. That couldn't be further from the truth. We're all prodigals. Even the young in the meeting tonight, we're all far from God. And, you know, part of the problem that I had was that I couldn't see myself in the story. I thought it was for people who, who were much more sinful than I. But if you can't see yourself in this passage, well, you would need to see yourself in it before you would get saved. Because it really is a picture of all of us and how sinful we are and how far away from God. You see, it's important to note who this really was for. In verse 1 it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him, for to hear Christ. But the next verse says, And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, So it was for the Pharisees and the scribes as well as the publicans and the sinners. It wasn't just for the down and outs. It was to show the Pharisees that really they were no better than, than the publicans and the sinners and all needed to return from the far country, acknowledge their position before God and just take his grace as he offered it. So, dear people in the meeting tonight, from the youngest to the oldest, we're all far from God and if we could only see it. But anyway, he, he gets his money and he goes into the far country. You know, perhaps there's some here tonight and they're looking for, for freedom. You just can't wait to, to get some freedom. No, you know, I don't mind coming to gospel meetings, but I would like some personal freedom. You know, this boy got personal freedom, but it wasn't really freedom at all. He thought he was getting freedom. What he really got was independence. And he left the father's house. And, you know, it wasn't too long before he realized that what he had in himself wasn't enough to satisfy him. He had went out on his own. He had longed for it, he had got it, and he realized just how hopeless it was to be out in the world on your own with no hope and no prospect. To all who are in the meeting tonight, perhaps you're young and, and so on, I would urge you to get saved while you're young. Don't even try to go out to the far country. You're a sinner in the sight of God, but if you're if you're longing to taste the pleasures of the world and the riotous living that we've read about here, you know, I was saved as a young boy, but you know, as I look out across, I was thinking to myself the other day, actually, that whenever I was growing up and through primary school and so on, there was boys in my class that I was jealous of, and they didn't have to go to all the meetings that I had to go to, and Sunday was another day in the weekend where they could do what they wanted. And I was I was honestly envious of them. And perhaps there are some that think about that towards their friends as well in the meeting. But you know what? It struck me the other day, I heard a boy was getting married. And I thought to myself, all those times where I wanted to have a life like theirs. And you know, 
there's hardly one of them tonight that is saved. They're all still on the way to hell, and they heard the gospel as well at Sunday school and so on. But, you know, the bondage becomes great, dear people. I know perhaps in the meeting tonight you don't think much about the bondage of sin, but the world, it's a terrible place. It really is. It ensnares people. When they no longer enjoy the world, they're still trapped by it. You know, there are people in Ballyclare tonight and they're as miserable as anything. And yet the last thing they'll do is come to the meeting here. The very last thing they would do, they'd sit at home in, in misery before they would come. And that is just the bondage that Satan has them under. They might even acknowledge that if they came, there would be some, they would hear the gospel and so on, but they won't come because he has them trapped and ensnared. But we're all under bondage, no matter whether you're the worst in the world or a child here in the meeting tonight, sin has its hold upon you and you need to be released from the captor tonight. But <clears throat> one of the, the, the things about this man, if you read, there's quite a lot of detail in the passage that I'll not touch on tonight, but he went and wasted his substance. That was the time probably that he enjoyed, but it came to an end. It came to an end. He couldn't sustain it. And, you know, it was after that he spent all that the famine arose. Things, it's not just that there was no food. Famines happen and people run out of food, but people who have money still eat. But it was the combination. You see, everything becomes more costly in a famine. And that's really what I was saying about people being in misery. You know, there's no fun in it anymore. And the cost goes up. And yet you're still trapped. The cost of sin is a terrible price to pay. You know, there's costs in this world to sin. People, people are, are captured by it and so on. Some enjoy it for a while and then become disenfranchised with it and realize they're they're locked in. But you know, the price that we pay on this earth for sin is nothing to what awaits the sinner who dies in their sins uh, without Christ. You know, there's a whole other world out there when you close your eyes in death and enter into eternity. It never ends. It's all right talking here tonight about the pleasures of sin and the joy that people get out of their sin and the misery it brings in life. But dear friend, the real cost is once you cross that line because it is truly horrendous and terrible what the sinner will endure for all eternity, righteously under the judgment of God. That's what's at stake tonight. And we would long that you be saved tonight. But the famine arose. And the one encouraging thing here is that he began to be in want. Now, that's one thing that I would love for everybody to recognize tonight. Whether you came to the meeting without a thought about your soul or not, you're in want. You're in want. You need to be saved. Whether you continue on in your sin, perhaps you think you have another, you'll wait five years and then you'll get saved. You need the Savior tonight. That's one thing that has impressed all, all the saved ones who are at the meeting to, tonight and all of our families who are saved. Recently, there's been a burden that time is running out and the clock is ticking and the day of grace will soon be over and there'll be no opportunity to be saved. You don't have the five years. You don't have the 10 years. And if you're thinking of waiting to the next series of gospel meetings, dear friend, that is folly too. It's sad to think, but I fully believe that hell will be full of people who are waiting for their next opportunity. God is a God of love and a God of grace that we have in this passage tonight. But the offer is there for you to be saved. If you refuse it, you refuse it. God will not force anyone into salvation. If you're going to be saved, you will choose to be saved. You want, if you want to be saved and repent of your sin and accept Christ as your Savior, you can be saved. And it won't cost you a penny. But if you decide to just continue coming and going from gospel meetings and never go in for it, that cannot go on forever. And as much as God would love to save you, his righteousness would not allow you for him to just land salvation upon you, so to speak speaking reverently, I trust. You know, some people think that, there, you know, at a certain series of meetings, something will be said and it'll just, I, I'll be saved. It'll just hit me. But that's not true. That's not true. Ask your parents, ask anybody, that there are certain things 
that must happen before a soul is saved. And we have them in this passage when we read that he came to himself. You might ask, what is that? Well, it's just an honest recognition of his true position. Where am I really at? Perhaps you think that you're fine. You'll get saved. I know the gospel. I come to the meetings. My parents are saved. I would get saved. There's no reason why I wouldn't be saved. Dear friend, if you're here tonight and your parents are saved, thank God for it. And you're you're greatly privileged and we thank God for it. But it's by no means a guarantee that you'll be in heaven. It's not. You know, I thank God that my brothers, my brother and sister are saved. But it's increasingly sad as I look over all the cousins and Sunday school friends that I grew up with. And many of them, like many of them, percentage wise, are still on the road to hell. No interest apparently about their soul. And grew up under the same circumstances as I grew up in. It's a serious thing. The world which we live in today is so entrapping. There are so many distractions, so many things to 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 just capture your mind, even momentarily, and the thoughts are gone. If you have a thought about your soul tonight, that's not given by me or, or Johnny. If you have a care about your soul, that's given by God. That's the voice of God. If you want to be saved tonight, it's not our voices that are doing that. It's the voice of God. But if you go home from the meeting and you reach for the first thing that you can get your hands on, you know, that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. He just wants you to do anything. It could be simple, trivial, not wrong at all, but he'll use it. He'll use it. And we live in a world that is just full of distraction. Uh, We recognize it ourselves, those of us who are saved. You have something to do and something else takes your mind and that's it. Gone. You can't think about it at all. We would long tonight that if you want to be saved, get away from all that. Put them all away. You know, there's no point selling your soul for distractions that are, are, are trivial and take away the voice of God. Go in for it tonight. We would long that you would do that. But an honest, an honest recognition of where you're at. You're a sinner before God. You don't deserve salvation. That's one thing that's very hard whenever you're young, maybe to to recognize, is that I don't deserve anything from God. Perhaps you think you're not too bad. You know, we're just total enemies of God, really. We run away from God like this boy did. We turn from him. We try and go as far away as we can. When we hear his voice in a meeting, we shut it out of our minds. We are just everything that God wants for us, we don't want in our natural state. We would long that tonight you would realize that you're on the wrong side. God wants to save you. And if you go in for salvation tonight, you could be saved, but it must involve a recognition of where you're at before God. And that is totally undeserving of his grace. Just a sinner in the sight of God that deserves his punishment, deserves his wrath. A boy at work said to me this week, I know that you believe in hell and so on, and I do think there is a hell but I know I'm not good enough to go to heaven, but I don't think I'm bad enough to go to hell. So many people think like that. Maybe in the meeting tonight, you're thinking that too. I understand that I can't go to heaven because I'm not saved, but I don't, I don't see why I should go to hell. The reality is that there are only two places and you can go to heaven. You should never have been allowed to go to heaven. None of us. It's a wonder that any of us will ever land in heaven. But the opportunity is there. And if you reject that opportunity, well, then hell is the only place that God can send you righteously. And as I close, you know, no man gave unto him. That's another line that we have. Nobody else will. There was nobody that he could turn to. A man allowed him to feed his pigs and eat some of the pig's food and so on. But he realized that no man gave unto him. There's nothing you can do for yourself. There's nothing we can do for you. And there's nothing that anybody out there can do for you. Salvation is between you and God. God is willing to save you, but you must turn. And there only is one who can help, and that is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to be saved tonight, you must consider him because you can think about your sin all day long and think about hell and 
if you're having thoughts about eternity, don't banish them at all out of your mind because they're important. And that's the Spirit of God working with you. But you must get to Calvary. You must. I remember struggling for weeks before I got saved and thinking about hell. Uh, and I was so burdened. And I thank God that, that that fear of him and of eternity was put in my soul. But I couldn't get by it. I would do anything but look to Calvary. And you know, the moment that I realized that I could never save myself and got to Calvary, that was the moment I got saved. If you're going to be saved tonight, you must look to Christ. Look to the cross. Because the bottom line is that all the punishment that I've mentioned tonight, if you reject Christ and go to hell and eventually the lake of fire and suffer under the judgment of God, you know the saddest thing about that is if you end up in hell. I believe the saddest thing about that is knowing that it, it never had to happen. How awful it will be for people at the great white throne to realize their doom is sealed, settled forever, no hope. And they, they never needed to stand there because Christ had died at Calvary, that they would never be there. The punishment for your sin that God demanded righteously, sin must be punished, that's non-negotiable. Sin must be punished. There's no, there's no alliance or tolerance for sin uh, under a holy God. And yet that punishment that was due to us for our sin was borne completely by Christ at Calvary. He suffered under the wrath and judgment of God as our substitute that we wouldn't have to be in hell, that we wouldn't suffer the punishment for our sins which we deserve. And although he was sinless, he bore that punishment for us. If you can get there tonight, and rest on the fact that he has satisfied God with that work at Calvary. And that as a sinner, you take your place and you just acknowledge that when Christ died in Calvary, it was for me because I'm a sinner. Get there tonight, dear friend, and enjoy all the blessings and the, the bounty of the Father's house. He's a kind God, a loving God. The word would have you believe that the God of the Bible is full of hatred and is incompatible with today's values and so on. God doesn't change. We change. Society changes. God doesn't change. And on a solemn note to finish on, that means, dear friend, when he said that those who reject his son will end up in the lake of fire for all eternity, it will happen. God is a God of his word. I think some people hold out for the fact that when it comes to the bit I'll, I'll get away somehow. It won't happen. God is true. God is holy. But it also means that whenever Christ said it is finished and God raised him from the dead, that sacrifice will eternally stand. God will eternally be satisfied. When we're in heaven for a hundred million years, we will still look back to the cross as the only reason we're there and it'll never need to be changed. Rest on him tonight. Get to Calvary and trust Christ for salvation tonight. Just as John has done, we welcome you to the meeting this evening. Thank you for coming. Now we'll open the scriptures again, please, to Luke's Gospel on chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> and verse 4 says, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Then over please to chapter 24 of the same gospel, Luke's gospel, chapter 24. <coughs> mm. Verse 1 says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you, when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, 
and the third day rise again. And finally, please, to Revelation <clears throat> and chapter 20. <coughs> Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And we trust that God would bless the reading of his holy word along with what we have heard from our brother John. <clears throat> it's just been upon my mind this evening to speak to you about things that were expected but not found. Things that were expected but not found. I'm sure we've all been in the situation, even the very youngest here, you'll know what it is, boys and girls, to go looking for your toy in the toy box or maybe a bit of Lego in the, in the big box and to find that it's not there. And you'll have heard the voice of your mother or father saying, well, where did you leave it? And where did you last have it? And even us who are older, there's many times in work, I go to the toolbox expecting something to be there, but it's not there. And that happens every day. Half my day, I think, is nearly spent looking for things and where I've put them. And everyone in the meeting knows what it is to expect something and yet not to find it. We have come in and we have read about three scenes tonight, three portions of Scripture where people were expecting to find something and it was not found. First of all, I want to bring you to a tree. And here's a man coming, looking for fruit off the tree. He says, these three years I come seeking fruit and find none. Then <clears throat> in Luke and chapter 24, I want to speak about women and later on men will come, coming to the tomb this time, expecting to find the body of the, the man that they had followed for so long. For these few years, they had followed him, listened to his words, were completely astonished by him. They loved him and they came to his tomb and they couldn't find him. You know, it's the foundation of the gospel this evening to come and to tell you, dear people, that the Savior that we present tonight is risen. He is not here. He is risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. We have a risen Savior, one who tonight is by his Father's side in heaven, one who is ready and willing and able to save all that would come unto God by him. Then I want to leaving the tree in the tomb, I want to bring you to the throne, the great white throne. And I want to think there about a name and it's sought for and it's not found. You know, friend, it would be an awful thing if anybody here in Ballyclare, your name was sought for in vain. You know, I would say that everybody here, we expect you, we expect your name to be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. God expects your name to be there because with all the privileges that you have had in your life, how could you not be saved? And yet those words are sounded forth. Whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What an awful thing, friend, for your name not to be found. Firstly, a tree. We have this great picture, this great parable that the Lord told about a man coming to his vineyard, coming to seek for fruit. And there's one tree in particular, and you can almost see him arriving and almost going straight to the tree. And he says to the keeper of the vineyard, he says, three years I've come seeking fruit upon this tree. And he says, I can find none. He says, you know, cut it down. It had just got to him. For three years, he had came diligently to the tree, seeking for fruit, caring for the tree. It was taking up a place in his vineyard and his money was sustaining it. He was paying a man to look after it. The fig tree had all the privileges of the other fig trees. And yet he says, three years I come seeking fruit and find none. He says, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? You know, friend, I want to leave a solemn message before you tonight and ask you, how many years has God come to your life seeking fruit and find none? 
How many years has it been that God has come looking upon your heart and your soul, looking for fruit, looking for something that would bring glory to God, and yet the Bible says that he found none. He has found none. Seeking fruit and found none. Maybe there's someone in here for the first time, or maybe there's someone who is young and you're still trying to understand the whole message of the gospel. Well, the Bible tells us that there's nothing in our lives that could bring fruit to God. The Bible tells us that even our very righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. The Bible says there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so you sitting tonight in the meeting, both young and old, if you're not saved, friend, you have nothing in your life that brings glory to God. You're a sinner. There is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then if God comes to your life seeking fruit and he says, for many years I've come and I find none, cut it down. Surely God is right and righteous and just saying, take it away. There's nothing for me. You know, friend, this will be a good meeting tonight. If you went away realizing that you have nothing to give to God, you're a sinner in the eyes of God. The Bible says that our iniquities have separated between us and our God. And someday, friend, someday, the wages of the sinful life that we live will be death. The wages of sin is death. And because of our sin, someday God will close his hand upon our breath and God will take us out of this life and he'll take us into eternity. Let me ask you, friend, if you were to die tonight, where would you be? Where would you be? I see young boys and girls here. I know you're young and you think you have many years ahead of you. If God was to say enough tonight, cut it down, where would you be? Older friend, many times you've heard the gospel. Many times God has spoken to you through his word and yet you still sit in this meeting unprepared and unwilling to bow the knee before him in repentance. You're a sinner, friend, and you've come short of his glory. And if God was to close his hand upon your little life tonight, if God was to cut it down, you would go out to everlasting judgment. You know, it just comes before me this year. <clears throat> There was two men that worked very closely with me. At the start of the year in January, there was a young man only of 22. He worked with me for about two years every day. He was six days a week. Nearly he was in the van with me every six days of the week. And there was, he, he had been boxing and he had dislocated his shoulder and he texted me saying, I'll not be in for a few days, Johnny. I says, that's all right. That was maybe on a Wednesday night. And then on a Sunday night, I text him. I says, well, Sam, what about the arm? He says, oh, it's still, the shoulder is still sore. He says, it'll probably be Wednesday or Thursday before I'm back. Do you see, friend, within, within 12 hours of him telling me about Wednesday or Thursday, he was in eternity. His mother or father, his father it was, found him in bed, unresponsive and cold. A young man at the age of 22 had just had a daughter about two months before. He was looking forward to raising his daughter. He was looking forward to his life. He had plans. He told me about buying a van and going out on his own. Plans for his life. But God's cut it down. There was an older man, as I've said. <clears throat> I was very friendly with him. He was a saved man. And I'll just tell you a little bit about him. You know, he, he lived in California for 15 years. He was an, an illegal immigrant in California. And he told me that after 9-11, they had got very strict and they had were very strict about who was there. And one day, driving down the road, a, a, a policeman had stopped him and asked for his, his citizenship or his card or whatever documents he had, and he had nothing. And they took him and they put him into a detention center. And for five months, he was there in the, de de the detention center waiting to come home to Ireland. And just one night, <clears throat> there was a man who was in the bunk bed ab above him an African man, and the man was saved and he handed him down a Bible. And David, his name was, David knew the gospel. He had heard it from a child. And that night reading through the Bible, he repented of his sin and he trusted Christ as his saviour. One, that time, as I'm saying, just there about May time it was, he had texted me on the Saturday and Monday was the May day. He says, Johnny, are you off on May day? I says, I am. He says, I'm going to come round. I want to see the house. I was building, I'm building a house. And he says, I want to see the house. I says, David, it'll be good to see you. Come on ahead. The next morning, 
at his work on a Sunday morning in Alder Grove. He was a security guard. While driving the, 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 the Jeep around the perimeter of the fence, he took a massive heart attack and before his head hit the steering wheel, he was in eternity. Thank God he was saved. But friend, those things just come before me now. And I want to ask you again, if God was to close his, his grasp upon your life tonight, where would you be? This is the solemn reality of life. This is the solemn reality of eternity. This is the solemn reality of the gospel that every one of us are born in sin and not fit for God's presence. And every one of us, if we died in our sin, we would be cast into hell on the lake of fire. These three years I come seeking fruit and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? The tree, fruit that was sought upon the tree, and it was not found. You know, it's with great, with great privilege I can stand before you tonight and turn to Luke chapter 24 and tell you about a man called the Lord Jesus Christ. And as women gathered this morning, the first day of a week, they came very early in the morning. The, the gospel writers tell us they come to his tomb. And coming to his tomb, seeking to come with their spices and all these other things, they come and they see the stone rolled away. And out of those group of women, I judge Mary Magdalene, she runs off to tell Peter and John what had happened. And these other women, they enter into the tomb. And the Bible tells us that they see that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's away. And then they see these men, these angels, these, what, what a wonderful view it must have been just to see these men in shining, in shining white garments. And they say to these women, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Maybe there's someone here this evening and you would ask, Well, if he was such a great man, why, was he, why would he have been in the tomb? Why, why would he have been there? Well, of course, many will know in our gathering that just three days earlier, while hanging upon a cross, men had done their worst to him. They had taken him and they had nailed him to a cross and they had uplifted him before all those people that were watching. And after six hours, very unusual hours, three in light and three in darkness, hearing the cries of him on the cross, he was suffering as he hung there upon the cross with a crown of thorns upon his head, blood like he dripping down his face. A nail, nails through each hand and nails through his feet. And then suddenly at the end of those six hours, he cries, I cry, and in the English translation we have it, it is finished, it is finished. And then seemingly just bows his head and dies. And soldiers come, and there's on, on other, either side of this man, there's a cross and criminals on either side, and they break, they break their legs just to, just to hurry up the process of death. But when they come to this middle cross and they come to this man called Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is over his head, King of the Jews. When they come to his cross and his body and see that he's dead already, they didn't break his legs, but they took a spear and they thrust it into his side. And out from his side flowed blood and water. No doubt about it, he's absolutely dead. And for three days he lies in a tomb. The man who is killed and murdered as a criminal, he's buried like a king, like a prince, given a tomb where a never man was yet laid in this lovely garden. These women come to his tomb seeking to find his body and the Bible says that he's not there. You know, friend, tonight I want to not only tell you about a Savior who died, but I want to tell you about a Savior who is risen again. The Bible says he was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. And unlike so many religions in the world tonight that point to different people who live good lives, people who wrote down what they think is good, good things and wrote good books and so on, Every one of those religious men, they're dead and they're buried and their graves can be visited and their remains are still here upon earth. But here's a man, friend, and his body tonight cannot be found. He's risen. He's risen. And after 40 days of proving to not only the women and his disciples, 
Um, the Bible, P Paul, right in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you can read it for yourself. He says he appeared to Cephas. That's another name for Simon Peter. He appeared to Peter. Then he appeared to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 at once. And he says, many of those 500 can st are still here, can still recall the story, can still witness to the fact that he's living. Friend, tonight in this meeting, I want to tell you that there's a one in God's right hand at, have, at God's right hand in heaven, and he's a living, glorified Savior. He passed through death. He bore your sin in his own body upon the tree. He finished the work that had to be done for you to be in heaven. He bore your sin in his own body upon the tree, and God was so satisfied with what he'd done. God raised him from the dead, and tonight he's risen. He's glorified. He's the Son of God. He came into this world, not to condemn the world, the Bible says, but that the world through him might be saved. And he lived a perfect, spotless life. Often we love to retrace his life while here upon earth. I have just recently been enjoying the remarks of the, in, in Mark's gospel, just that little section in the middle, how people were amazed at what he'd done. You know, chapter 4. We read about those, those disciples on the boat. And after he had calmed the storm, those disciples said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? What manner of man is this? In chapter five, while on the way to heal Jairus' daughter, you know very well about that woman who had the issue of blood and she grabs his coat and she's healed. And then going to the house of Jairus and raising his daughter from the dead, we read about that house and all that were in that house were astonished beyond astonishment. That's the end of chapter 5. At the end of chapter 6, we read about him again in a storm walking upon the water. And the, the, the disciples are amazed. And as he crosses over to the other side, when the people heard that he's come, they bring their sick out to the streets and they just seek to grab his coat, to grab his garment, because the Bible says that everyone that touched his garment was healed. At the end of chapter 7, he, they bring before him a man who is deaf and dumb. And as he heals that man, those people say, he has done all things well. He maketh the dumb to speak and the deaf to hear. My friend, let me tell you that that one that hung upon a cross and that one that God raised from the dead, he was a perfect spotless man. The perfect spotless sacrifice of God. John could see him and can say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And is it any wonder that when he had done everything that God had given him to do, when he had finished his work, when he had borne the sin of the world in his own body upon the tree, God raised him from the dead. Friend, again, I would say it again. We preach to you tonight a risen, glorified Savior. He is one who is worthy of your trust, friend. He is one who can save you. He can save you right now in the meeting. Is there someone here and you would love to know your sins forgiven? We've spoken about people and they sought to have their diseases healed. He can heal your sin tonight, friend. He can heal your soul and make it fit for heaven if you would trust him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and God says, thou shalt be saved. A, a, a tomb things that were expected at a tomb and were not found. You know, before the meeting closes, I want to tell you about a throne. Things there that were expected and not found. We read about this throne, the great white throne. What a scene it is. As John writing here in Revelation, he gets a glimpse and he tells us of the great white throne. And the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books are open. You know, everyone in this room will be at that throne. Every one of us. Every person that has ever come into this world. Every person, every baby that was ever conceived. Every man or woman, boy or girl that has ever lived. We will be at that throne. There will be those of us that are saved beside the Lamb of God. Beside our Savior. And there will be those that are not saved and they'll stand before Him. The dead, small and great, shall stand before God. And the book shall be opened. And in these books, we read about a great, another book, the book of life, and it's open. And at the end of this great passage, it says, whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
You know, friend, it's an awful thing to think about, but it's reality. Is there people here tonight in Ballyclare and your name has never been written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You're not saved. You sit here in your sin. You reject God's Savior. You reject God's Son. And if you die, friend, as you are on this great day, your name will not be found. You'll be cast into the lake of fire. Your life, you were given all the privileges in your life that you, your name might have been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I think of the words of Paul in chapter 2 of Romans. He says, knowing not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as he spoke about those cities that he done his mighty miracles in. He said, woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the things had a bit that had been done in thee were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. Woe unto thee, Capernaum, exalted to heaven with privilege, shall be cast down into hell. You know, friend, what an awful reality will dawn upon the sinner who has grew up in su such privilege to realize that your name was never written in the book of life and to be cast into the lake of fire. Friend, I would urge you tonight, I would plead with you before this day comes to an end, before even this meeting, before we sing our last hymn, repent of your sin and trust Christ for your salvation. And you can have your name gloriously written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can have your sins forgiven. Know that you'll never be told to depart from God, but you'll be with His Son for all eternity. But remember the solemn words. If you're going to be wise, thou be wise for thyself. If thou scornest, thou alone shall burn it. Whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire. Shall we pray? Our Father, we come before thee. We think of the solemn realities that presents themselves to sinners tonight in our meeting. How it is simply to believe or to be condemned. We have heard many times how men have said it is turn or burn, salvation or damnation, heaven or hell for all eternity. And we pray that even tonight, as a result of this gospel meeting, some dear soul might strive to enter in, might know Christ as their Savior and might know their sins forgiven, might repent of their sin before thee and trust thy Son for salvation. We ask that thou may take us to our homes in safety. Bless our little time together and bless it with salvation we would ask of thee in the Lord's holy and precious name. Amen.